loud enough. Call to hear me. If you're not, raise your hand and let me know. Right. <laughs> so, here we're just talking about uh, practical crypto review for the developers. Um, we're going to look at common mistakes that developers make when they're going through crypto, cryptography, some of the impact of when you kind of make those mistakes. It depends on what the mistake is in the context of and how to avoid them. Um, I have edited this a lot. I had a whole bunch more slides in here, and it's still a long presentation. You can probably do two or three presentations. There's just so much to do. So many mistakes. Um, it's available on the GitHub, so you don't have to go and take pictures. Take one picture for that. You have the GitHub, and then you don't have to take any more. Uh, speaker notes have the references to any of the source material. At least I tried to do that. So you know, it's not one of these things where a he said this, but why did he say it? It should be in there. And that way you can go and look it up for yourself. And sometimes people make mistakes. Things change over time. Our knowledge do this, so it's a good thing to have. Um, this is under Creative Commons license, but we're going to have some images that are going to be under Creative Commons license. And, or maybe under Fair Use. I think you'll notice those. Uh, a little bit about me. I was a product developer for over 20 years. A lot of system level stuff, a lot of device drivers, a file system drivers, and BIOS work, uh, all of them are storage. Arena. Uh, I've worked at Symantec for a number of years, product security groups there, and the different party software, and the process. And also started learning about crypto. They had a lot of crypto experts um, Guys who did PGP and did the process there. So do more than I want to um, But I am not a crypto expert. I'm not an applied crypto expert. You know, crypto stack exchange, I can answer some of the questions. And others, I look at them, I can't, not only can I not answer the question, I don't understand the question so that I can answer it. But what I have learned a lot of over the last 10 years or so is the kinds of mistakes that developers in my company and the open source community that we use, we use lots of open source, the kinds of mistakes they make, and they make lots of mistakes, and those mistakes tend to be forgotten as we will see. So, first off, we start with. Crypto is hard. <laughs> it is really hard. You have to do lots of things correctly. And if you screw up even one of them, you could potentially lose your data or compromise the security of the data you're trying to protect by encrypting it. And it's often really difficult to tell until you just look into the cyber test. So, we have two outputs up here. One of these is from a broken implementation, another one is from a good implementation. Can you tell the difference? Well, you've probably gotten through it and said, hey, those are the same. They are. Oftentimes, you cannot tell that something's broken just by looking at the output, and particularly one output. It might not be the first one, it might not be the second one, it might be the 10,000th one, or the million. You might not see it at all. And that's the reason looking, doing like unit tests and trying to figure out what looking at the output is that right. You can detect some gears that way. A lot of times, the best way to figure out the problem is to look at so here's a real world example. Uh, we had uh, a presentation in this group earlier on ransomware. And one of the ransomware authors came to this big They tried to create an RSA key, 120 device, but they kind of just made it dirty. So what they did was they created one of 128 decimal digits. When you do the math on that, that's only a little over 400 bits of data. That's in pre. You can break that in a day. No so. You have one job. Get your crypto right so that people can't decrypt it. Go right around you. And they screwed it up. So, so why is crypto hard? Well, there's a 2018 study on crypto usability. And it's, it, it, it's in the speaker mention. You know, go look at it. See a video of a presentation about it. It's not the greatest study in the world. Um, and to be fair, it's hard to get something like that. They're trying to find volunteers. People would sign up for it, and then they wouldn't follow through and things like that. So it's not a great set. But as you can see, there are 20% of the developers thought they had completed something securely, and these were simple tasks. And they had. Yeah. What they found was if you guys have bad documentation, that was a 20% version, or equal, I have seen some examples of that, and very secure examples. And then the one thing I'll add there's lots of little gotchas that you don't see in the documentation. And we'll go cover a few of those. So here's an example of an insecure example. Um, this has to do with Java key stores. 
And what if, when you pass a password to the Java key store, and basically you do a password to do that, right? you don't want to do it as a string object because it's not going to, it's going to be in memory until that string object is garbage collected. You're not going to know when it's garbage collected. So, but they want to set password there. That way, after, immediately after you use that password, you can zero out the password. What do they do here? They create a string object, which means the password's in that string object, and then they get the character array out of there. This is totally wrong. Thing is, I looked up about eight examples on this. Every one of them did this. Every single one. And not one of them commented on why you shouldn't do it this way. They took a shortcut because they were trying to show something else. But at the same time, they screwed it up here. And people just go, I paste, there is a character. Click the button, Online. So, first one, cryptography. Don't create your own cryptography. Hopefully everybody's already heard this. This is really the, from the mom and apple pie part of the presentation. I'm hoping everybody knows. Uh, always use standard cryptography to tell um, I've only encountered one time when one of my product teams did this. And it was so bad, it wasn't really encryption, it was really just obfuscation. That bad. Um, like one might. <laughs> uh, to say that was not good. But even in the standard software, you go to Java today, Java key stores, default Java key store using the homegrown crypto features are not broken. And they don't even encrypt the full key store, they just have portions of the data that's in there. Don't expect it to be secure. And one of the things I worry about, particularly with my keys, is people creating custom algorithms. Using standard primitives, and we give an example of a uh, key, custom key derivation function. How we do push crypto reviews is we have a questionnaire, about 25, 26 questions, major questions. And then with each of those questions, we have sub questions. You know, if you do this, then tell me this, that, and the other thing about what you're doing. And one time I had this product team, I asked them, do you create, do you use any key derivation functions? Answer, no. Okay. Then I'll make them look at about a month or two later, I'm reading something about the product and said, hey, we protect this with a password. And I'm thinking to myself, that would be a perfect place to use the derivation function. So did I remember this right? Because I don't think they used it. I looked up the review. Yeah, I remembered it right. In Mulder now, so some other memory of this is used to it. And I emailed the security link. Dude, what's up? I see this, I see that. What do you do? And he said, yeah, we do it that. We do that. He created his own custom key derivation function, but did not realize that he had created or in his own head that it was a key derivation function. So my part in there was I asked the wrong question. So the question now in that form is if you generate a key in any way other than random, tell me about it. That questionnaire is a beginning of a conversation. Tell me more. Sometimes I'll spill everything in right. I've got no problems. But lots of times, you got to dig in deeper. And lots of places in this questionnaire, you'll be surprised to get to where it's, I'll ask a question and then I ask a similar question someplace else where they're going. How people will contradict themselves. They'll say they don't, they don't do any hash functions and then after they'll list three hash functions. What the hell? I mean, this is just, you're contradicting yourself, explaining it. And it could come up with a variety of reasons. How many I have to work for right now? We have products that are brand new, we have products that existed literally 30 years ago. So the older products, yes, they weren't around to be created. It's been five, six generations of developers since then. So they have to go look stuff up. Sometimes three questionnaires are filled out on multiple people. Lots of different reasons for that. So, we've got Bruce Schneider. Hopefully everybody's heard Bruce. We can all tell Bruce. <laughs> uh, you can read the quote there. And I'll give another little story to make in the notes. Uh, Bill Zimmer created PGP. He was in college. Created this algorithm. He thought it was perfect. No way to break it. NSA wasn't going to break it. GCHQ, GCHQ, no one had NSA, probably wouldn't cage me back then. Nobody was going to break this. A couple of years later, he's going to come in through a crypto bubble. Going through, hey, there's that crypto algorithm I thought of. It's unbreakable. Except there was a whole other assignment on how crypto analyzed it because it was very crypto. He didn't see it. He was a smart guy. He was crypto, but wasn't as smart as he thought. And here we'll go comment. Um, so this comes from Synopsys. Hopefully everybody knows what Synopsys is. If not, they're a, a major security vendor. They have lots of secure products. So it's all for you. Lots of things. Uh, we do business with them. Anyway, they found a bug in IBM's uh, random number generator in the crypto provider. And as you can see, it's 
see right there. I tried, it doesn't show up very well, but I will do. If you wrote your own pseudorandom generator without help from crypto experts, assume that it's disappeared. And we can genericize that. If you created any crypto on your own, assume it's disappeared. <coughs> Not create your own algorithms, don't create your own implementation. Same thing I like it. And where this becomes particularly hard is with open source. Because we pull in some open source and we pull in some other open sources dependency and some other open sources and other dependency. And somewhere in that mix, you're going to find some crypto and there's somebody did it wrong. So you get, now you have to start thinking what's the risk of using it? Am I willing to accept it? Uh, implementation issues are really hard. You can see there, openness itself. They fixed eight side channel models in the last seven years. That's a very widely used library. Now imagine you're somebody's little library where five projects use it. How likely are the side channel models to be fixed now? That developer, you know what a side channel model is? Well, it's one created. Um, so, protecting your cryptographic secrets. Again, we're still in the mom and out of pie section. Secrets there, protect them. Key wrapping, apples, whatever. You need to protect your secrets. What happens when you don't protect your secrets? Well, Nikon and Canon both make high end cameras. Oh, okay. so they make high end cameras. One of the features of the high end cameras is that you can digitally sign photographs. Take them. It's really cool. Uh, and it's needed for things like forensic work when you want to go to the court and say, hey, this image was not altered. Or uh, particularly freelance news photographers. Where there have been a few occasions where people have photoshopped some photos, they've been published, and then they've found out later that they were photoshopped. Bad thing. Well, this Russian firm, I'll understand why I say Russian in a second, uh, they were able to strike a private keys to sign photos from both of the vendors. This is what happens when your private key is no longer private. <laughs> they go and say, hey, this is really cool. I don't think someone was holding an iPhone ever. In All three photos were passed. Uh, I think this was from Canon. We passed the Canon verification program saying, hey, this was an authentic photo from one of our cameras. It's a bad thing to know. <laughs> Random numbers. <laughs> yeah, there's also a good silver part too. I don't know why this one's easier. They're obviously fundamental cryptography, but they have to be really, really random. If they're not, bad things can happen. So you don't you want to avoid the non-cryptographically secure random number generators. Ran, random, map that random, version of list from there's a hybrid count in any language. This is an example. You want to use cryptographically secure random number generator. Typically what you'll find is a deterministic random bit generator. That's a form of random number generator cryptographically secure. Uh, and then there's the non-deterministic one like you're going off about. So here's what I consider to be a failure. I forget which project this is, but some new JS apparently. Um, so what he's trying to do is provide an interface in front of a bunch of other random number generators, so you don't have to worry about it. And that first one, that's great. That's cryptographically that's secure one. That's very accurate. That one is two. That one is three or four. But that one's not. So you use this and crap. In crypto, and you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know if you're going to do crypto or not. And if bad things can happen. Seeding a deterministic random bit generator, and this recommends 112 bits of security. That means you need 112 bits of entropy. Minimum. You'd like more. You'd like really like 128. And the seeds can be bigger. Uh, if you go to the standards, you'll see it depends upon the actual community or the counter mode, if you need to or whatever. But corn is always better. And I've seen some of the craziest ways to see your random number generators. Taking the system name, current username, things like that. Let's hash it all together. Let's throw it out there. And that's my seed. It's a terrible way of doing it. It is so reforceful. It's not even funny. That's so what the secret there is. The secret there is the method that you use to create that number. That's the only thing that's seen. What you want is a big, large number that is truly secret in and of itself. And like I said, the amount of entropy in that case is not the alpha of the half. The alpha, it's like the 
you like the system name. You have a name, you maybe go up to like uh, 10 characters and then figure out what your, your alphabet is. If you're going the numbers and um, alphabet character, you're probably. And here I give an example of an open source program, 7zip, uh, when most of you have got. They, they fixed a lot of their crypto, and we're going to see a couple more examples of things that they did wrong. Um, they had a process thing, a thread ID, and system uptime, and that was their CD. That's horrible. That is so reforceable, it's not even funny. Don't do that. Go find real system ID. If you're on an Intel machine, you can use read C and read RAM. If you're, um, Windows, this is usually the operating system. The only time this is really a problem is like the Internet of Things kind of thing. And then you have to go into some crazy stuff of trying to use um, random extractors and uh, like interrupts and stuff like that. But that's probably not my most important thing. Right? Time is a terrible entry resource. One year, less than 25 years, I'm going to be 112. I'm not going to have one year. I'm not going to have 100 years. You got to look at other places. And just to give you an idea, we'll talk about RIS again. That's the name. NSA was trying to break the commercial crypto. Their number one target was going to be a random number generator. Tells you how important random number is. Just to give you an idea of how bad things can be. This goes back to 2008, I believe. There's a Debian developer doing some maintenance on OpenSSL. He was giving an error without outrunning or verity or something that was got to analyze. And what it was doing was hashing an uninitialized file. Generally, that would be a bad thing if you have uninitialized data there. Well, in this case, it was intentional. It was a great place to put a comment. So we put a comment in. He went and asked about it. Hey, people, um, somebody told me what's going on here. And didn't get an answer. So he removed it. Well, the purpose of that thing is to try to figure out, well, hopefully there's some data on the stack we can use. We'll hash it up. We'll throw that into our entries. That was not a very good source of entropy, but it was better than what they had with otherwise. Because what they were left with otherwise was just the cost of stuff. 15 bits of entropy. 32 states. 32 k states. So you have run it for 2K times, guess what? You're guaranteed you're going to have overlap. And actually, you go on the birthday problem, assuming that, um, we'll talk about birthday problems in a little bit, chances are they had it in wickets after a couple hundred lines of it. Um, and the worst part was it took over 18 months for someone to notice it. Same key. Okay, 
some big guy goes in and figures out, hey, that's what the key is. I can write a decryptor for that. And then it's like, we got a decryptor. The moral of the story there is, good guys can find static keys of malware, bad guys can find static keys of their software. We have some static keys on our product today, but only because people made mistakes before, and we have to correct them, and we have to keep backwards compatibility. But other than that, we don't do that. Um, so, key derivation, I talked about a little bit already. Uh, the purpose of the KDF is to take various forms of entry levels, entry levels, such as a supply graph, a password, random numbers, just stirring it all up, making it kind of hard to figure out how the key got generated. And then you have your key, and then the point of being that it's an attacker will either have to have that secret or have to know the full method of doing it. You basically already talked about this. But the thing here, I, I mentioned this earlier in my, in my presentation. Um, everything, crypto system should secure up everything done by the key. Two can have to have a key in the beginning. And if they just know the process you do, like a uh, substitution cipher or something like that, that's not secure. It's not your own dollar. The code is there. Somebody can go and this is some of your code here. So, And similar with the you know, CD number and the number generator, you have to have sufficient entropy to keep it And I you know, re emphasize the date time. So, symmetric encryption modes, of course, if you start getting a little bit more. So, we'll talk about four different modes. There are other modes, but I don't personally have any experience with them, so I'm not going to talk about them. People talk about DCD. Found out using our What I tell my teams is, I want you to use GCM mode unless you have a good reason not to. The reason I tell them that is because it's authenticated. And the data is good. An example of why authenticated is good if you look at TLS 1.3 or ADS at least, there is only one mode that's supported. It is GCM. CDC mode is gone. Uh, other modes, I don't remember if they were in your TLS 1.2, but for ADS. So, the final few terms now. So, authenticated encryption means we've heard about Bob and Alice and Eve. Uh, the Bob tells us that Alice created the cipher text. It also means that Bob can tell the cipher text has been altered by Eve or not. Now, this will add over that to the cipher text. Authentication tag that is created, sort of like an H map. And that restricts where it can be used. For example, you have a database, you have 80 characters for a field. You want to use GCM now, you either have to reduce the amount of text that can be put into that field, or you have to create your database tables originally so that they're big enough to get all authentication tags you want to use. That's used lots of times CDC mode. A nonce, the number you use only once in a particular context. If you use a nonce and zero, it doesn't mean you can't ever use a nonce and zero again. It just means you can't use it with that particular other thing, that context, for example. IDs and keys, we'll talk about this in a minute. Lots of times, IDs are nonces. That means you only use it once, a particular ID number with that particular one, one time. Another key comes along, you can use that same number. If you use it more than once, sometimes this can happen. Then bad things happen. How bad could happen? The nonce is usually your counter for a problem. So, the first big problem or the first big problem is How many people have heard of this? Okay, good. So, it's one of those situations where something, it's a problem because it's not something you would think would be. And how many people would have? Yeah, wow. The odds are roughly 50% that some two of the people in this room have the same birthday. And it seems, you know, there's 365 or 366 days a year. That doesn't seem quite right. It seems like an odd and odd. But you sit down, you do the math, and that's the way it comes up. And, you know, 
stranger. You have so many people in the room. You have a 99.9% chance that two of those people are going to have the same birthday. And I don't know about all of you, but to me that just seems wrong. But you do the math and not wrong. And it becomes important. Why it's important? Because lots of times we come to a random number. It's supposed to be a nuts. It's a repeat. So one of those probabilities that that repeating is going to be very low. It's never going to be zero because if we use random number even twice, the probability is non zero that it could repeat. That would be sort of an extreme for a large enough random number to actually repeat. But we don't want to keep the number of repetitions, so we do something very low so that we make the likelihood of it happening very low, and therefore you have to do you know, uh, some very, very high number of operations before you might have one chance of happening, reasonable chance of happening. And then the last term we're going to be following is additional isolation vector. Is that quark block encryption. And this is just quark block encryption. There's IDs in other contexts which are similar, but we're not going to talk about them today. So so, lots of times, block encryption modes are able to rock, manipulate the plain text data based on something from the previous encryption of the previous block. Well, first time you do it, you've got to have some data there to manipulate it. And that's what the IDs are. And IDs are not zeros. Lots of times, people want to encrypt them or do something. So, first off, VC mode is only secure when you Encrypt this thing with a block of data. And yes, that's going to be 16 bytes. Any other use of it is insecure since it's going to, you have to repeat the data over and over again, potentially. And that's why it's rarely intentionally used, not highly intentionally, we'll see that. And because it's on operates on one block, you don't need that previous data that the 90 would block. It's the one mode that doesn't have that. So why I said intentionally, well, Turns out that ECP mode is the default. Remember, we were talking about uh, bad defaults before when we were talking about crypto is hard? Well, here's one of the reasons why. In Java, with, it turns out that the default mode is um, crypto provider dependent. So, an IBM provider can do something different than the Sun provider, which could do something different than the XYZ provider. But the default Sun crypto provider that comes with Java, Oracle Java, comes with OpenJDK. Can you specify no mode there? We would have a slash mode there. Um, it's going to be an ECU mode. Once had a team, I'm going to talk about that question here we had before. Uh, how do you generate your IDs? And I got the answer back. We don't generate IDs. Really? <coughs> now, it's a touch turn out. I can get an okay answer in the sense that if you don't specify an ID, some library will generate an ID for you. But that was not the case here. They were encrypting with ECB mode, and they didn't mean to be encrypting with ECB mode. And it was a bad thing that they were doing that, and we fixed the book with the problem. Java is not the only one with this problem. Guess what? Hyperflow has the same thing. I don't understand why it's not moving. Counter mode. ID, in this case, is a 16 byte nonce. And every time you go through the counter, every block gets encrypted. That ID, that initial ID that gets specified by the developer, gets incremented one time. And if you only use it one time, you can safely use any of it. ID. If you always there's what zero there, you can use a random number there, it doesn't matter. It's going to be safe. However, if you encrypt multiple streams, using multiple IDs, a counter mode. Then typically what happens is you partition that 16 byte space into a non-space and a counter space. Uh, it can be any, you can do it any fashion you want as long as the counter is at the end of the bit screen. So you don't have to do eight bytes. You can do, um, you can do 120 and two, or 120 and eight or whatever. However you want to split it up in this way. However, it's really bad to use it. one of those values. Because the ciphertext of two blocks have been encrypted the same. 
the x order from the other depths equivalent to the x order of the plane heads. That will allow the attack to potentially decrypt the uh, return of the data. It doesn't give the decryption key or the key, but it lets someone it gives them some good information. We'll see that in a minute. And you can see that's it for the next Let's see the next day we see the next day. Got two pictures. Tuck's got cut in half. We encrypted them. We merged them together. We see Tuck's on the bottom. Now, Tuck's is not his original self on the bottom, but we know what he is. An attacker can figure it out. I can figure out what it is. So, some problems with counterfeit. Explicit use of the IV. I'm going to encrypt 10 data streams. These Particular key, ID of zero, or ID of one, or ID of whatever, it's just an ID every time. Uh, that's a problem. And you're going to potentially leak a lot of data out by hand. Potentially lose a lot of stuff, right? The more insidious one is the reuse of the counter because there's overlap in the data. So I, I um, generate a, a counter, let's say, so we start off, let's say I'm confused about this, I'm a confused developer, and I think I am supposed to be the one that's doing the information of the counter, and I don't even know one at a time. So I do one data data here, and then I do one data data here. And I start by counter zero. Oh, I do one data data, zero through, let's say, oh, it's easy. So I'm going to have a, my counter is going to be 1,023 at the end. Zero to 1,023. Now I start with one, and I do 16 data data. I just had 1,023 blocks that got re-recorded using the same data. This would be really, really bad. It just leaked a whole bunch of data. And probably most of it, if not all of it, is for somebody who knows what they're doing. This is not something some average person is going to sit down and figure out. But somebody who's skilled and knows what they're doing will be able to do it if they are some of and you can see there, um, one of the things we dealt with not that long ago was they were just generating random IDs like they would be for CDC. And you know how they get data from You know how many times? Say something. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and so this is one of those times where it says the output looks good. You know, be a broken one or not a broken one. This is the perfect example of that. You could run that a thousand times, ten thousand times, a million times, it might not get overlap. Or, or you could do a get overlap on two times, and run it for data. And you don't know what's going to happen with that. That's one of the most insidious ones there. Do you see how both the little counter book provides uh, authentication? I love this book. I got this book off of the stack of string. The thing with GCM mode is it's brittle. It doesn't have any yet break. Because there's just so many places to screw it up. There really are. And that's part of one of the things we come back to. It was hard. There's a lot of places to understand. So, uh, the nonsense provided by the developers used to generate an ID. This recommends the 12 byte nonsense that we expanded up to 16 bytes for the full ID line. And they recommend a maximum of 2 to 32 IDs, basically, or uh, 4 bytes. But you also notice this thing on the bottom. If an ID is ever repeated, even once, I mean, all over, a forgery pass. In practice, this requirement is almost as important as the secret. So if you have one key and you have a million data streams, or a billion data stream. You sort of know, you just can't encrypt as much data as I well, I have teams that are like, no, we're just going to generate random IDs and we're just going to encrypt as much data as we need to for them for how for long. And that doesn't work. It really doesn't. I had to There's also a 64 gigabyte limit on the amount of data. And if you go over that limit, it, it you move back to the potential for a poor human message. You have 10 minutes. You're good. Uh, this is a long presentation. <laughs> I know. I think I remember you said it was long, so.
I mean, yeah. you're the last one, so I guess it's not the worst. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Well, here's the last one in here. The last one in here, yeah. yeah There's yeah, other ones still, going yeah. on, but yeah. Well, no, but I thought there was a, a wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we, we did it. So, um, if you're generating your own tags, always use the kind of the tags. I saw a quote from somebody who, he did not back it up on Crypto Stack Exchange, but he sounded like he really knew what he was talking about. And again, I'm not the crypto expert, so I have to I rely on other people, and it's like, I, li I like the references, it's usually part of who's going to provide them, but at the same time, I'm trying to figure out who you can trust if you can. He said, if you're encrypting more than one megabyte of data, Use 120 bits. Isn't what you can get down to 64 bits if you were just doing a small amount of data. And never mix tag points on it. If you do that, you're well, you still yeah. you not know, that CDC code takes a uh, double by 16 ID. ID should not be predictable to an attacker and they should not be reused. This becomes particularly important again when we talk about, go back to counter mode. I've seen people. Um, see people just put in this call time constant with the ID is that is not secure. That is as predictable as predictable can be. I've seen people they'll generate the ID the first time, but they keep on using that same key and that same ID. Whenever a field changes, they just update it. Same thing over and over again. Well, that's not secure. Here's where things start to a little bit weird. Um, the ID link is 65, 64. I, for some reason, it only seems to happen with CDC mode. I see people doing 32 by IDs. And it's not insecure. This is what's not taking for 16 bytes. I don't use them. But, and what I think it is is that people get confused between the key link and the blocks on the ID side. I'm not, not positive about that, but that's what I, I think. And to me, it's not, it's not insecure. I'd like you to fix it, but it's a big flashing light to me to go, I need to look at your stuff a little bit more closely because you got this wrong. Maybe you're confused about other things. Seven dip. One time I had a length of eight bytes. Where the hell that came from? I have no clue. I'm confused. I'm sure we're really perplexed. But here we go. I've got to use predictable. One out here. Our IDs need to be totally unpredictable, and it wasn't. How bad that would be, uh, I'm not an expert at decrypting these things, but I bet anybody who wanted to start decrypting that kind of stuff would have said, I like that. It's a good place to start. So, contrasting the various modes. IDs are known as pretty much everywhere. The CDC mode, you can have an issue with an ID on one encryption. Just one. You have a compile time constant for your history. On the other hand, with the other modes, it takes at least two to screw up. And the simple way to deal with most of this stuff is never um, encrypt more than, never use more than one ID for this. It's going to take more work, but you will avoid certain issues by doing that. If you start using multiple IDs with the same key, you have to be careful. Here's the one that's, that's the hardest to find information. <laughs> And the one I worry about is we're enterprise. Uh, we do enterprise class data storage. So we have huge amounts of data. I don't know how many people actually face this one. But we'll go um, All life cycle modes lead to some information. So the more data you encrypt with your key, the more data you lead. The guidance you know, uh, on this had been, and this comes from a book by Schneier, Ferguson, and Kono. Was that you should limit yourself about two to thirty-two blocks with CDC mode and about two to sixty blocks uh, with counter mode. So two to thirty-two blocks, I'm doing my math right, I believe 64, 64 gig. And then two to the sixty is that by three. And that doesn't matter how many items are not just so you can just do one one stream or a bunch of streams. It doesn't really matter. And the reason counter was longer because there was no collision due to the birthday problem instead of the CDC. So, real quick on the CDC thing. Um, remember with CDC, what happens is it takes the encryption from the previous block, XORs that plain text, and then encrypts that um, new value. Well, the more data we start creating for that encrypted 
detect more, more bytes we have, the more likely we are to generate them. And the exact same 16 bytes that we have generated previously. And that's where the problem becomes. If that 16 bytes is the same, and the plain text that we're encrypting happens to be the same or similar, particularly at the beginning of that block, then you can make a whole lot of bunch of data. Potentially, you can link up to 60 bytes a day. That's really where that. Now, keep down to those limits. The odds of that happening to come down to, I think it was 2 to the 48 or something like that. I mean, it's, um, some really low numbers. But the more data you go, higher, higher the odds. But there's a recent paper I'll put into in the speaker notes that say there's some other count, um, most yeah, other issues with counting mode. So if they suggest limiting also to 2 to 32 as well, um, you might go up to 2 to 40, that's up to you. But anywhere from 64 gigabytes to 60 terabytes. And here we go. How much data do you want to limit? How much data do I want to do with the short key? Do I want to go? Am I only going to worry about how much data? You know, well, I need the 64 gigabytes. Well, let's say I want to have data. I want to have it encrypted. I want it to be safe for the next 30 years. And I don't want to have to worry about rewriting it because I think it's, um, it might be compromised. And as you have attacks on the data. So the best attack today might be to the 40. But, you know, what was it? last month there was a um, new attack on SHA 1. They took off. Uh, 3.7 bits, I think it was, on the attack um, vector tweets about 13 times faster. Well, 13 times faster made it mean something that used to be infeasible in most cases, it's starting to become feasible. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that's how good the attacks will be. So, instead of going for 64 gigabytes, you might want to be really um, cautious and go only 1 gigabyte or 2 gigabyte. Depends on what the data is. If you're encrypting the real launch codes, you know, it's that kind of level of detail, then you convert that importance. And maybe you go a lower amount of it. But if you do uh, grandma's recipes, get them out. It's all about risk tolerance. So we're going to zoom to this outdated crypto. We talked about modern crypto. There was a presentation on that earlier. And over here, I just want to turn off the SSLD for your release of the ETLS. So RC4. It's been compromised, been compromised for years. The problem is there's still people who are using number generators based on RC4. They're all other plus. You want to use it? Uh, this is one of the things when you end up sourcing. Look at it, determine what your risk level is, are you willing to accept it or not? Um, SHA1, uh, the only thing SHA1 is good for anymore is an HMAP um, that I'm aware of. There might be other people, but I only know about one. Even then, I'm sure people will move on, but it won't be my card. Uh, here's the test. We're using TLS 1.2. Get rid of RC4. Get rid of triple dots. Uh, yeah. Let's see if you're using the common. All these 20, 2048 dots. Uh, a whole bunch of SSH stuff. A lot of this stuff is still, unfortunately, in the end. I don't know why. It's, it's insecure. It's known to be insecure. There are RCs to get rid of it, but those RCs have not been enacted or uh, put in place yet. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not really an expert. None of us are probably ever really the experts, but hopefully you know a bit more than you when you came to the room. That's it. It's 59, so you're fine. You can take a couple questions if you want. I mean, it's kind of on the side, but uh, the, uh, what, are you, what are you thinking of? Like, I don't know if you have any kind of crypto panels, challenges that they have. I've seen them having gone through. Oh, I was going to say, like, what, how accurate and realistic do you actually think those are? The last time I looked at that stuff was a couple years ago, so I wanted to think Anything else? I want to talk about the, the crypto pilot stuff. It's, it's actually pretty current. It has been very close to the actual NRBT finding, even the latest to get the links. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, to go further into challenges to get to the real stuff, like the first time. You got to get like. It's an investment. <laughs>